Influencers, inspiration, and Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. This is Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Here's Connor Begley. So welcome everybody to another episode of Earned. Uh, you know, our goal in this podcast is to bring you the most interesting people that we can find in the beauty, fashion, and lifestyle industries. Um, and I think today we've really found a couple of fantastic folks. Um, so we have David and Adam here um, who are who have, are the founders of Ana Luisa, uh, which is a jewelry brand, a sustainable jewelry brand that goes direct to consumer and does all in-house designs. Um, so this might not be a brand that everybody's heard of, but you definitely should have. Uh, so from an EMV perspective, they're growing at over 141% year over year for 2020 to $16 million in coverage. Uh, they've grown the number of influencers talking about them by 103%. Um, each influencer on average talks once per month, so six times during the last six months. And all this while apparel is down double digits from a year-over-year -year perspective, so apparel and jewelry is down. So they are bucking the trend there. And then if rumors have it, they are growing quite quickly from a revenue perspective as well. Um, Adam was saying that June was the best month they've ever had, so continuing that trend. Um, anyways, thank you so much for joining, guys. Um, if you want to give a quick introduction just about who you are, I think people would love to love to hear it. So thank you for yeah, thank you for having us. First of all, um, of course. So we are the two yeah co-founders of Ana Luisa. Um, we are originally from Paris, as you can hear. Uh, we both had kind of the same background, growing up in France um, and coming to the U.S. a few years ago. Um, we had then different path, and we'll talk about it uh, probably later on, but. Uh, but we've been like very close friends for the last seven years and prior to launching Ana Luisa and, uh, and yeah, very happy to be, uh, to be here with you today. Um, yeah. Awesome. So let's, well, let's talk about that kind of seven year period. So I don't know this, but I kind of did some searching on LinkedIn and uh, saw that you guys both went to business school at the same time at EM Lyon. Um, is that where you guys met or did you meet before that and decide to go to business school together? How did that work? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. We actually, uh, yeah, we, we went to the same business school, but we actually met uh, in China, uh, I believe in, in early 2013, uh, and we were sharing a cab actually to go to a nightclub. Uh, and we actually didn't know each other, neither that we were going to the same business school. Uh, so very random uh, meeting, I would say. Yeah. Wait, that's wild. I had no idea. So you guys met in China in a cab randomly and you just happened to be going to the same business school? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're actually going to a nightclub that day and um, yeah, that's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> that is not something you will find on LinkedIn. Met at nightclub. We're on the way to nightclub. <laughs> in Shanghai, yeah. In Shanghai. Wait, why were you both individually in Shanghai? What brought you guys to, to China? So part of our business school um, program was to spend a semester there. And so we were in different programs, but we met there randomly at the, yeah, in April or something like that, 2013. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. Um, well, so, okay. So then after business school, right, you guys both finish. Um, and Adam, you went the kind of tech and investing side. And David, you went more the kind of e-commerce and the jewelry side, fashion side. Um, can you guys talk to me about each one of your journeys there? Um, I'd love to hear, hear both. I mean, you've been business school before I did, so. <laughs> so yeah, right after business school, I got, um, I got hired by a company that was manufacturing and designing jewelry for a lot of big brands in France, like Louis Vuitton, Kenzo, and they really wanted to expand into the U.S. market. So they, they contacted me and they, they sent me to New York on my own to build the U.S. Um, structure. So that's what I did between 2015 and 2018 where I basically created a company here to work with as many fashion uh, brands here, brands like Tory Burch, Nordstrom, Alexander Wang. And I would help these guys design, manufacture and distribute uh, their jewelry. So I was kind of an insider into that industry, um, which explains a bit why we are we launched Ana Luisa later on. Um, and Adam had a very different uh, background. And, and right after business school, I think I had something a bit more, I would say classic past. Well, I went, uh, I, wrote, uh, I worked for Rocket Internet, which was kind of the uh, big incubator of, uh, of an e-commerce company uh, in Africa. Um, and then I went straight to uh, VC, uh, which is, uh, I would say, kind of like what every business school wants to do, you know, like uh, M&A, VC. And I was uh, working for a, 
uh, Pierre Edouard Sterling, which is the founder of Smart Box, which is a, a geek box experience, uh, the largest in Europe. Uh, and I saw so many different kinds of business uh, and e-commerce was definitely one of the things that was bring the fastest and were very uh, interested in investing in more uh, e-com business because of the margin, because of the business model. Um, and then when David went to the US, I joined him six months later and I worked for obvious.ly uh, and I was the head of product there, which is a, an influencer marketing software. And that's really where I learned a lot about uh, the way brands work with influencer marketing and how they can like, leverage all the social media, uh, including Instagram, YouTube, and so on. So at some point, we had the same clients, except that I was taking care of their jewelry business and he was taking care of their influencer business. And we're kind of working <laughs> together without knowing any of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like a kind of perfect match to start a brand, right? Like you've got the, the kind of experience on the investing side and on the influencer side. And then on the product side, David, you had a ton of experience. Um, yeah, I mean, outside of it being kind of obvious that you two should get together, what was the process? Like, had you guys stayed in touch over the years? Like, tell me about kind of what the, like when you guys decided to start the brand together, how did that process work? I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's something we had in mind for, for years. We, when we look back and look at emails from 2015, uh, we were already like bouncing ideas for, for many years before launching on Louisa. Um, and at the time, we were, since meeting in China, we've been very, very close. And then we had different jobs, but we would do side gigs uh, together uh, in a lot of different spaces, like affiliate marketing, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we tried so many <coughs> Kickstarters. We, we did it all on the side. Um, if one of our projects even went on French TV, but without uh, our name being displayed anywhere because we had our jobs. So at some point we, we were like, okay, we've had enough with our, with our current experiences. We want to build something that, that doesn't exist, something where we would be in charge. Um, and I was seeing a lot of things happening in the jewelry, play, in the jewelry industry. You know, it's a very traditional retail um, industry. I would see all of this opacity regarding like manufacturing, costing, pricing. And so I knew that something was happening online. We would start seeing those direct-to-consumer brands um, emerge on all of these verticals. And in the jewelry space, we had the feeling that no one was really taking that um, opportunity to offer like super high quality jewelry at a, at a very fair price. And that's, yeah, that's how over the course of several months, we've been thinking about it, looking at every single aspect possible of the, of the market. And then we decided to go for it. Yeah. And that sounds very, I would say, I think of crystal clear when David says it, but the process was basically the both of us like sitting on the floor in the living room and like taking every individual industry one by one, looking at every criteria from market size, is it easy to do e-commerce? Can we do influencer with it? And like, I have no idea how many like kind of market research studies we've been through, um, dozens if not hundreds until we say like, Wait, you've been working in jewelry, it seems to be so used to get back to jewelry. And, and yeah, as crazy as it can get, jewelry was not our first idea, I would say, but it's the one that we decided to move on. And what's interesting also regarding this, uh, this interview is the fact that influencer marketing back in those days was already in our minds uh, when we picked uh, jewelry. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the key uh, lessons that I learned from, from Adam at the time was that if you want to have a successful product with influencer, you want that product to stand out visually on their on their photos or videos, which you used to call a vampire focus. Um, and so, jewelry was definitely one of the most obvious choices in that in that direction. So, before launching the company, we already had some designs in mind that would be very visual and that are one of our best sellers to this day. Um, and part of it in my, might be the fact that it's extremely uh, eye catching whenever you are you're watching a YouTube video. Hey just does really well in an Instagram photo, right? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, what's funny is at the same time, I think that the jewelry industry was kind of slow to adopt social media, slow to adopt the influencer space, probably because, you know, I think in some ways as a luxury brand or jewelry brand, you kind of, uh, I think they looked down on social media for a while and in influencers. So uh, you guys got two big trends, direct to consumer and influencer all at the same time. So totally makes sense. I mean, you guys are capitalizing on two big trends there in terms of kind of a slow moving industry with high margins on the jewelry side. And then obviously it lends itself really well to social media and to influencers due to the visual nature of the product. 
Um, so now that you guys have been kind of working together for a couple of years, have you guys figured out like who handles what? I have to imagine that, you know, David, you're on the product side and um, Adam, you're on the more on the marketing side, but have you, do you have some crossover there in terms of how you split duties? Yeah, and what's interesting is that our previous experiences were very complementary. Um, yeah. Where everything that relates to um, the brand, the products, um, the supply chain, and the logistics would fall on my uh, uh, my part of the job, and Adam would take over on everything that is marketing related, acquisition, uh, customer experience. Um, so obviously, we have a lot of topics in common, but that's that's a general uh, distribution, and all of the tech is under Adam as well. And then do you guys have like an official, is one of you the CEO and the other, or are you guys both co-CEOs? How does that work? In reality, um, we have two big names for, for investors, I would say, mm-hmm. more than for us. So officially uh, I'm CEO and Adam is CMO, but in reality, uh, one brain could not run the company, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, John and I, as we've built the company, you know, John's the, the CEO, it's what common misconception in the market. And it's, uh, I think it's both important for investors for sure. But then I think as things get bigger and you, your teams get bigger, I've found that it's really important for decision-making. Not that like we're both fully aligned kind of on most things. Um, but like the team needs to be able to say like, okay, I'm traveling. Can they go to John and get the answer that they need? Right. Um, and to feel confident that that's the right answer. So it'll be interesting for you guys as you grow kind of how that, how that works. But obviously I think having a really tight co-founder relationship is super important, which it's sound. I mean, you guys are sitting side by side in the interview, so it's gotta be, it's gotta be close. Right. Um, Okay, cool. So let's talk about, so that's kind of how you started the company and kind of some of the challenge, or let's talk about some of the challenges actually. So for you guys, as you have been growing, so you're growing really quickly right now, you know, where have you experienced challenges? Is it on the influencer side? Is it on the supply chain side? Maybe you haven't had any challenges. Maybe it's fundraising. Has there been anything that's particularly difficult that you guys have had to work through? I mean, I would ask you the other way, like what was not a challenge for us? And uh, because it's it's impossible to think of anything that was not a challenge. Uh, we, were in, we, were, we grew up in a different country. We had no network here, no connections. Uh, we have those French, big French accents when we speak. So everything has been a, a challenge for us, uh, to be to be honest. But that's that's what makes it, makes it uh, very exciting, I would say. Um, yeah, on every every aspect, every possible thing that could go wrong went wrong, or is going to keep going wrong in the future. Like we are very aware of that. And very humble about it. Um, uh, that's where the fun happens. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. that, I don't know if it's fun. We we've done the same thing, and it's uh, I don't, sometimes it's not fun. <laughs> I mean, really, since the beginning, everything went was kind of complicated. Uh, um, so I mean, fundraising, which was the first step, and, and, and uh, we didn't raise so much money, kind of the minimum to to get it going because uh, it was kind of a uh, well, my philosophy to say like let's do the let's stretch every dollar to its maximum right uh, um, mm-hmm. so but just try to raise funds in the jewelry industry no one wants to invest in this business it's uh, old school two guys uh, two guys I mean despite David's experience uh, mm-hmm. none of us have ears pierced uh, 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 and yes yes we knew the, the the challenge for a guy to buy jewelry and to gift it but 95% of our customers are women, are women buying for themselves. So, so definitely we were like, hey, you're missing an art director. Hey, you're missing a woman. And, and, and it was kind of true. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For, for our experience, that was higher that we really needed to do. Uh, so this was kind of the first really difficult uh, uh, challenge. And then, as you were saying, like the fact of growing that fast has been one of the biggest challenges to date. Um, getting off the ground was the, was, Felt like the hard part, but scaling it, scaling it up as we grow is definitely even harder. Um, and that that touches every department in the company, whether it's logistics or marketing or influencer. Um, as we get bigger and bigger, we have to make sure what whatever we're building now is going to last for the next um, years or decade. And so that's right now. This is one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. So just across the board, kind of everything scaling up. I think, I mean, we've been through similar periods of kind of hyper growth. And I think that 
it is, it's like one of those things you don't want to complain about because it's a very good problem to have, right? It's better than the reverse, which is like, I can't grow, I'm struggling, whatever. But uh, so it's a very high class problem. But at the same time, it is a real problem. And, um, and I think because you're growing so fast, you're kind of building, but you're trying to build the foundation for a company long term, you want to make sure that you're laying those kind of proper foundations, which is difficult to do at, at that rate, for sure. Mm, um, so you mentioned investment, you know, have you guys taken on additional investment since then? Or have you been tempted to? I mean, obviously, being Kind of a fast-growing direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand in a in a high-margin category has to attract investors. Um, have you guys raised additional funds since then, um, or have you kind of held off and just uh, worked with cash flow? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we actually so we we did our first seed round, uh, um, and then uh, we did a, a seed round uh, because um, so we raised with European funds. And, and to be seen as an American company, because the company is American, and, I mean, it was very important for us to be seen as an American company. We had to, I would say, onboard an American VC. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, we raised a, a seed round, I would say, last September. Uh, we closed it last September, and, and we had follow up from our existing investors, uh, plus we onboard a, an American VC. Um, no, it, it's been in our philosophy to, to be profitable. Uh, as early on as possible, uh, and, and that's something we did. Uh, thanks to many, I would say, the way we acquire our customers. Uh, we don't have the philosophy, and we can discuss this later on, but of brands spending thousands of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on paid advertising uh, just for the sake of growth. Uh, we kind of built every department of the company to make sure that we don't rely on anyone um, but ourselves, and that everything was cost efficient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not something easy to say to your VC, I mean. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to grow as fast as you can at all costs. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, I need your money, but I'll use it very wisely. So, I, you know. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, so I want to talk about your product before we get into the influencer and marketing side of things. I'd love to talk a little bit about your product release strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, from what I read on the website, it sounds like you guys do these kind of this similar drop culture, right? Where you make product drops uh, every week or on Fridays, at least when you do make those drops. Um, what was the thinking on doing that? What have been some of the challenges of it? Um, you know, do you guys, I would imagine you typically sell out, which is really exciting, but talk to me a little bit about the thinking there. I know that for a lot of the people, like, you know, just this idea of kind of drops in the fashion apparel industry has been a big topic for a long time. So I'd love to hear, you know, what the challenges have been there as well as what some of the learnings have been. So the original idea came from my previous job when I was working with all these big brands. And I was always shocked whenever I would talk to them, I would say, hey guys, what collection are you working on right now? And they would tell you we're working like 18 months in advance, like or two, a, a year and a, yeah, two years in advance on a collection and we're placing order a year before it releases. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how do you know what's going to sell? How do you know if it's going to perform and sell and sell in every, in every of your store? So we knew that by having a more direct to consumer approach, we could avoid all of these buying uh, meetings and trade shows and all of these things. So we knew that we wanted to test and learn as much as possible, which was like a very tech, um, I guess, learning uh, from Adam. So we decided to go for smaller batches which was much more sustainable to work with like smaller batches. If things go well, you accelerate. Um, and so we decided to do a weekly release so we could also um, get that point of contact with our influencers, with our customers, um, on new styles being released every week. And if something works well, it stays on the website. If it doesn't, uh, it will just find its way out uh, progressively. And for us, it's, it makes a lot of sense, not only for like the sustainability, sustainability side, but also from a capital efficiency side. Like you don't want to commit to several thousand pieces of a style you have never tried before. So for us, that was the real idea behind it. And then uh, it made a lot of sense with um, the way we have our relationship with our vendors. Uh, we have It's all a matter of lead times, because if you do a small release, then you have to make sure you're going to be back in stock as soon as it sells out. And that's a big challenge in the fashion industry. And that's one of the biggest yeah, things we had to work with in, with our vendors. Yeah. In terms of your vendors, are they then located locally, like within the U.S., to make mm -hmm. that turnaround time faster? 
So depending on the materials that we use, we have um, a range of jewelers that are located in the US, in Europe, uh, in Mexico, and in Asia as well. Um, so depending on the materials and techniques, we would refer to one versus the other. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they, we work, I would say we go twice as fast and as any traditional jewelry brand in terms of development, production, um, and shipping. Um, which mm -hmm. is definitely a big advantage for us, given our acquisition strategy. It's interesting because that, it mirrors, so I had a really good conversation, unfortunately it wasn't in a podcast with uh, Laura Nelson. So Laura Nelson is the, uh, I guess, co-founder or co-CEO of Seed Beauty. So Seed Beauty makes uh, pop, or, um, ColourPop, which is now the number one or number two brand we track uh, within the whole US in that category. So they're exploding. Um, they are the they are the number one shipper of product on the west coast of the United States in for the USPS. So number they send more products than anybody else on the west coast of the US. Um, so they're they're big, right? They're doing very well. And for them, not only do they have so they've talked about speed as being like a really big advantage to a direct consumer brand. Speed and feedback, right? You can release something, get feedback. Release something, get feedback. Release something, get feedback. And, um, and for them, they have vertically integrated manufacturing in-house, which allows them to be even faster, right? They can like develop a product over the weekend and then have it in production and, and, and available within a week, which is just such a big advantage. Um, you know, she said that, uh, you know, I don't know what people are going to buy, uh, six months from now, let alone two years from now. She's like, but I do know what they want right now. She's like, I know what we'll sell right now. And so like, I, so it's a really big advantage. Um, so it's pretty cool to hear that you guys are taking advantage of that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, coming, yeah, coming from this industry, I was really seeing all of these brands, like going that long-term, like a uh, route for production and development, or they would take six months to make a product coming to life. Well, for us, we can go as low as 30 days now, uh, and we don't have, we don't have a production in the house. Um, and so for us, these times were like part of the, the story or the DNA of the brand from the get go. Yeah. Well, so while we're talking about that production process, let's talk a little bit about, you guys have been doing a lot of co-creation with the influencers, mm -hmm. it seems like. Um, and I know that for us, you know, when we surveyed the influencers, uh, this is about a little over two years ago, and we asked them, what is the most impactful thing a brand can do for you? And it was all these different things. It was repost my content, um, you know, let me take over their channel, highlight me on the website, all these things. Uh, the most impactful thing they could do would be co-creation of a product. Uh, because I think for them, it's just really, you know, they learn a lot by being involved in that process. And then also it garners them exposure, they make money, et cetera. Um, you know, what inspired you guys to do that? You know, how has it been going so far? Again, what are some of the challenges? Would love to hear you guys talk about the, the co-creation process. Yeah, so co-creation, uh, co-creation, it's, it's not something we just had an idea with and we say, hey, let's do co-creation with influencers. Um, I believe it was end of 2018 uh, uh, and, and we like were kind of kicking off our influencer marketing strategy and, and, and to, do the, to do so, we like decided to speak with a lot of influencers. And, and some of them were pretty big and, and obviously they have very high fees, uh, um, you know, to work with them because everyone, every brand wants to work with them. And given the kind of little amount we raised, it was just not possible for us to work with them. So we decided at least let's have a talk, you know? So we, at the time it was possible, but we, we had coffees uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, influencers and we're really asking them like, so what can we do that other brands cannot offer you? What do you really want to do with your content? Uh, what kind of skills do you have and you don't use, uh, I would say, express fully? And, and I would say 80, 90% of the influencers, and, and we probably still have this kind of survey that says like, um, I want to be more creative with everything I'm creating. I'm doing a lot. Um, I just don't have, I would say, the technical knowledge about designing clothes, designing jewelry. Uh, and when you have this conversation, I would say a dozen of times per week, then you figure out, well, we need to help them get something, you know, out of their mind. 
uh, we have the, I would say, technical knowledge to help them manufacture design. Uh, um, and we also have the infrastructure to help them sell it. And, and I believe that's how everything started. Yeah, and at the same time, we're seeing all of these big brands like flooding the influencer um, market with like products that people would just have to wear and say like, I love this shampoo and it's great. <laughs> and it felt yeah. so, it felt so um, not authentic that, that we knew that if you go into a co-creation process that's going to take you between three to nine months, where you start from scratch with an influencer and offer them the possibility to create a piece, the piece of their dreams, you know that the relationship they're going to have with the brand and the, the, the relationship of their audience with the brand is going to be so much more genuine. And one thing I learned from, from Adam was that if you're not genuine with influencers, no matter how much you pay, it's not going to work. It's not a matter of like how much you pay. It's really a matter of like how much does the influencer, how proud is the influencer to work with you and, and how proud is she to release this product on that on their birth, on her birthday and, and things like that. So we had a huge learning curve. We, we made, we, obviously we made many mistakes along the way, but creating, we, we create pieces from scratch with them. Like we really start from nothing. So it's, it's a blank page and we tell them whatever you want to do, we're going to help you make it. And it takes a long time to come to life, but when, when it does, um, it's shown to be uh, pretty efficient. Yeah. And, and what kind of the, I would say the, the baseline of everything that we came up with with David was like, so it's good for me because I'm creating something that is unique to me. And when the uh, audience is going to buy it, it's like, well, they can feel that they're really supporting the influencers. Um, it's good for the planet because it's always manufactured in a very sustainable way. And it's good for the society because most of the time we, we there is a charity involved that is getting a share of the process. So good for me, good for the planet, and good of the society was kind of the baseline of every cooperation we made. That's really cool. I think the fact that you guys aren't just kind of, you know, because I think you can take it the wrong way. It's like, okay, we're just going to put a sticker on top of this product, right? And now, now it's an influencer-created product versus saying, like, we're going to take, you know, six months, and we're really going to go through this process like you said, it endears them to the brand. They become a longtime advocate. It becomes aspirational for the other creators who go, oh, wow, you know, maybe if I become friends with Ana Luisa, I can design my own uh, piece of jewelry. And I think if you were just, just as a person, like it's just really cool to be like, this is mine. Like I made this, like I worked with them, but this is like, I designed this, this is my thing. Just is gonna make you, it's just such a cool story. It's so fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they, yeah, they get a chance to work hand in hand with a jewelry designer along the way. So it's, they're really like the art director or the creative director that they wish they were. And they do become the creative director of their own line or piece, uh, depending on the, the collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. John, my co-founder and I have always talked about starting a, um, starting our own consumer brand. I think the problem was we never had our David, right? We're like, okay, we need a David to be able to create the products. We never had that. So uh, it's pretty cool that you guys had both of those things at the same time. Um, so let's talk about kind of the, the nitty gritty on the influencer side. So I know that um, Adam, when we spoke, when I met you, right? Um, one of the things that you talked about was you guys really focused on YouTube. Like that was your first channel. Um, talk to me about what your strategies were there, how you approached the influencers, what were some of the tactics that worked well, maybe didn't work well, um, as well as why you chose YouTube as kind of a first channel to focus on. Yeah, so here again, it was not a straight path to, to, to YouTube. Um, we actually started with Instagram uh, um, and, and we, we contacted a lot of influencers and saying, hey, we're this cool brand referring to do this better than the others and play sponsor our product. And it was definitely not the right approach because also we had influencers posting uh, about the brand, the results were like crazy poor, crazy poor. Uh, and, and we could not blame the influencers at all because they were uh, doing exactly what we asked for, right? Um, so we kind of sat down again and think like, all right, what's really an analysis? Like what's in our DNA? And, and there was this story to tell about the way we manufacture jewelry, uh, how we strive to make sure that uh, we are affordable, uh, um, all the process about like becoming carbon neutral. Um, there were kind of a really a big story behind the brand, and, and, and 
I believe that the media, just a post on Instagram, wasn't kind of reflecting all the work behind the company. So we thought about kind of saying, what's the best way to tell a story today? And where do you go online when you need to tell a story, right? And long form video was actually the best thing that uh, was online for us uh, at the time and still is. So we had a look at YouTube. Uh, obviously, the influence on marketing was already there, like the market was already there. You had a lot of brand advertising, uh, but most of them were doing like just unboxing and reviews. And the way we try to switch things is like, I go to YouTube or on YouTube for kind of entertainment, listening to stories, things that are inspiring. The same way I listen to podcasts, actually, you know? Um, and so we, we actually contacted some influencers on YouTube that kind of had the alignment with us in the way they, they, they uh, uh, shop. So uh, a lot of influencers that are kind of minimalist, that really pay attention to the brand that they are working with, that were kind of selective in the deals they were getting. Um, and, and we write down, I would say, what we call the brief. Uh, I would say it's the technical term, but it's kind of a brand book uh, that we send mm -hmm, to, to, mm -hmm. to influencers. And, and, and it has kind of the core value of the company. And instead of saying, I want this and that in terms of content, we were more like, listen, that's what we are doing. We believe there is, a, uh, I would say, a value fit between you, your channel, your audience, and our company. Um, please give it a try. And, and if you like the jewelry, just mention it on your YouTube channel. Right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I believe it worked right after the first video. It was quite, an, quite insane. Like, as soon as we found this perfect alignment between the influencers, their values, and, and, and the brand, uh, mm -hmm. we figured out, like, okay, that's working. And how do we scale it? Was the next question. We were like, wow, we made this happen. Uh, uh, so, how do we scale it? And I would say that's where the logistics and production nightmare really began for David. <laughs> that's where it became David's problem. <laughs> David, what are you doing? I'm getting all these customers. <laughs> so, I mean, it was pretty much that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I would say you were asking us one of the big things about growing quickly. It's when we figured out that uh, this kind of collaboration could be a, a big hit and we really wanted to like, you know, double down on this, if not like do 10 times what we did the past month. Uh, um, it was like, all right, how do we... So finding the influencers was quite easy at the beginning because, well, we worked with 100 influencers. There are probably 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 more that have this perfect alignment and fit uh, with the brand. but. When we send them jewelry and they do uh, a, a video about, you know, the brand, people go on your website and, and they try to shop for the same product that they saw in the video, right? So the only issue is that we were shipping so many pieces to influencers that we didn't have any pieces left for our customers. So it was kind <laughs> of like doing advertising to, on a product page that is completely sold out. Yeah. And weirdly enough, it took us like three months to figure out like, why is the traffic not working? Like, why are these people not buying? And we just figured out that every time we were releasing a YouTube video, the product on the website was sold out. And, it was <laughs> and so... It so feels like that would be straightforward, but then, you know, sometimes you just miss those things. We, you know, we had, yeah. And, and so we had to, like, and that's, I would say, where communication between every department is key. And that's why we, where we decided to kind of organize the company as really a tech company uh, um, where every department knows almost everything about what's going on. Uh, we have big announcement of Milestone is because you contact influencers. They kind of decide what pieces they want to receive. Uh, 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 you ship them the pieces. So the production team needs to know what pieces you send to the influencers. And sometimes they also want you to, you know, push some new product that they've been releasing. So you have to ask the influencers, hey, basically we, we just released this product. Uh, would you like to give it a try? And so you need to have this like massive logistic alignment of everything. But then what you have to think is that the video is going to be released like three weeks, one month, if not two months later, right? How do you make sure that you still have this product in stock in two months? And, and I mean, 
Well, especially if you're doing limited run exactly. releases, like, right? Yeah, you're getting, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's tough. You, but it's almost like you have to re-release it, right? You release it once and then you release it again. Mm-hmm. Or like, like you said, you just kind of make sure that everybody is lined up so it all happens in order. Um, but I would say where we, where we got lucky was that audiences were coming to us with a genuine like, idea about what we, di- what we did. And so people would subscribe a lot to the wait lists on product pages on the website. And so we would see like some products with thousands and thousands of people in the wait list because they saw an influencer wearing it um, and talking about the brands and the values of the brand. And so whenever those products would come back in stock, they would sell out like the same day again, you know? So we've had this, this kind of like hyper gross issues on inventory where no matter how many, how many units we would order and order in, <laughs> they would be gone and within one week, you know? And and this, you know, I feel so bad for you. I feel so bad for you no, that you just good. can't, no matter how much we make, we just sell it out every time. It's a what good, a hard problem. It's definitely, good, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely a good problem to have, but it shows you one of the, the challenges we have, which means how do you handle inventory when you let influencers pick the styles they want to wear, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. So I mean, we talked, we actually thought about as a company going into that space and trying to get into helping with demand planning because you know you imagine say rihanna says oh i love anna luisa and you're like oh shit you know we don't have everything um and so you know so the problem is that you um it's very hard to predict demand versus like traditional advertising you say okay i'm going to advertise this product at this time this is how much i'm going to advertise it and so i should roughly have this much uh inventory right uh, but for you guys, it's very, it's much harder to predict. So that's really interesting to hear that be like a new problem. Um, we didn't end up going into it just because, I don't know, it just didn't make sense for us at the time as like a product edition, but it is a real problem. Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah and all of these, all of these happen in like within a year of launching the company. So it was a lot of, you know, new, uh, new challenges coming, coming up. Um, but that's why the relationship with our jewelers was super important so that we didn't Sometimes as little as two weeks, we would restock product and set it out again. Um, and so, yeah, all of the departments of the company are also very well aware of what's happening on the influencer side. Um, and I think that's a big difference with a lot of companies we talk to. So they just do influencer as a, you know, as a, as a the side, exactly as a side project, just to do some influencer marketing for us, it was very different and we took it much more seriously. I think before creating the company in our original deck. Uh, it was uh, like the DNA of the brand was was around that, and it took us a lot of mistakes and and and, and errors to uh, to understand how to build uh, our logistics uh, around it. Sometimes yeah. the fun part is we were still shipping everything ourselves. So when we had this spike of sales, it was us shipping like Friday all night, Saturday all day, Sunday all day, and, and it was really really insane. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I've I've been there. Uh, not shipping product, but you know, similar type stuff. Um, uh, lots of stories. Um, so let's talk. So let's talk a little bit about the team. Um, like, how big is your team overall? I would imagine it's still small, even though you guys are growing really quickly. Um, and then you know, you said that influencers kind of run through the DNA of the whole organization. But is there a team that's specifically dedicated to kind of the influencer efforts? Um, how big is that team? How involved are you guys in those relationships? Um, talk to me about the team and the structure as it relates to uh, the influencer space. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have overall, uh, we have 14 in the company and we have seven departments, uh, uh, including tech, influencer, uh, performance marketing is two different departments. Uh, CX, logistics, production, and design, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just for the influencer marketing, we have 25% of our uh, uh, team that is dedicated to influencer marketing, with, I would say, tech being also very involved. Uh, so beyond the management of the website, uh, they also help with the processes because now um, we are receiving a lot of inbound requests from influencers that are asking to work with us. Um, so, so yeah, um, and then within our team, uh, we have, um, uh, within the influencer marketing team, um, we have two persons that are really dedicated to cooperation, uh, because, um, we want to offer these influencers that are usually right bigger inside, uh, and 
the best experience possible. Like it needs to be fun, right? Uh, if they see this as another job or another gig, like what's for them? So we really want to make it as fun and seamless as possible. Um, so when you're asking if we're still involved with this, yes, definitely. I mean, David can talk about this, but he's in touch with like almost every single corporation uh, that we have. <laughs> and I, I like it. I really like it because I see where everything is coming from at the very beginning on the first call until the release. And even after the release, when we do another co-creation sometimes, um, and I really like that personal relationship with, with these influencers. And whenever they have this relationship with us, I, I, I feel like they go the extra mile. They would just go the extra mile, like genuinely, and without even asking for it. And so, yeah, we're definitely still involved there. <laughs> but, so, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I was going to say every corporation launch that we're doing is kind of a in event company. So, you know, like these companies that have like happy hour on Thursday night. Well, for us, it's a corporation launch when we have it. One during the week, it's really like all the team gathering around the screen and like look, looking at the YouTube videos and obviously looking at the website to see the traffic that is coming like crazy. And, and we kind of celebrate each of them as small victories and it's like really a fun moment. Uh, that's really cool. And that's again, like you said, that's just not for most corporations, it's this small thing they do on the side. And I think that, you know, you talked about you have 25% of your team, right? We say call it three or four people. You know, most of the, we talk to these large, we work with a lot of these large jewelry brands and they're going to, these very, very big, very well-known brands will have one or two, like people dedicated to it. And, um, and, and the thing that I tell them is like, you know, for you guys, you guys are managing, call it, you know, close to a thousand relationships at this point. Like how can one person manage a thousand relationships? Like it's just not possible. And so, and the, and for these jewelry brands, these big ones, it's, you know, thousands and thousands. And so, you know, they're just very much under resourcing it. And it's, uh, it's a, it's a pretty big missed opportunity. Um, and then David, to your point on the personal relationship side, one of the, so I don't love this book, but there's a section in it I really like. So, um, if you guys know, uh, Mark Benioff, he's the CEO of Salesforce. Um, so for us, you know, Salesforce is kind of the pinnacle of our industry in terms of it's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's gotten very big and it's software kind of like our software. And so one of the things that they found early on was, you know, they tried all of these marketing tactics when they were first getting going. They tried, you know, they bought a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal. They did trade shows, all these things. And they found that basically only two things worked. Um, so one was they would get their current customers with their uh, prospective customers in the same room and their current customers would sell their prospective customers, right, as a reference. So that's why they do the big dream force. They do thousands of events a year. Um, and then the other thing was being in the press, right? So being kind of in the press with Mark talking about the software industry and SaaS software and all these kinds of things. And he talked about, he's like, yeah, I personally managed all of those relationships because I knew that if they were talking to me directly and I had a personal relationship, the likelihood that they, we would get that coverage would be much, much higher. And so, you know, I think this is something that would be easy to say like, okay, let's hire somebody. That's your job. But like you guys being directly involved, I think is actually a pretty critical element. Um, and I think that, you know, on the influencer side, it shows that you're really invested, right? Like they, to the creators, it shows that you're invested. So that's really cool to hear. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, so I want to talk a little bit about this kind of micro influencer strategy that you guys utilize. So I know, Adam, you talked about like, how small do you go? You go like down to, I remember a number on the phone, what was it, like a hundred views in a video or 200 views, something like that? Yeah. I mean, why does an influencer have to be big, right? It's like, what's the reason behind it? Like, there is this common knowledge that says that, you know, the smaller the influencers, the higher the engagement, right? And, and it's definitely true. And usually what we found is an influencer on YouTube that would generate 100 views uh, will really talk to people that they know, actually, uh, kind of mm -hmm. like, um, I would say your second or third circle of friends that are watching your videos because they know you, right? And, and most of the time, these uh, uh, videos are like not as professionally edited. So content won't look as good. But what they're going to say on YouTube is really what they think about you. Uh, and 
I think that's only possible when you're a thousand percent confident about the product you're sending to influencers. If you just manufacture something quickly and put a label on it that says that's my brand, then this kind of influencers and they're hundred percent right uh, are going to say, well, I can find the same product at any any store, right? Uh, but if they genuinely look uh, online, do the research about your brands, and, and want to create content that feels really authentic because uh, they know that they have their friends watching them, and they know that to, <laughs> they have to pay a lot of attention to what they say. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> no, but it, it's true, and yeah, that, totally. it's going to be completely, completely different kind of content, and that's going to drive a very high engagement. Um, and, and also, if you feel that these people are aligned with our values, then it's a hundred percent yes. Like I don't care about your size. If you think that sustainability is the future of fashion, then yes, we're aligned and let's work together. You know? Uh, like, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, like, who are the hundred people that watch that video? It's gonna be like their best friends. Yeah. So, like, if they're telling them, like, "Hey, you know, I love this brand," um, you're telling that to all their best friends, right? And then, you know, the other dynamic is those people grow, right? So not all of them, but like some of them grow. And so when you start working with them when they're small, so the numbers on it, so it's about, you know, of people that have less than 100,000 subscribers or followers, about 6% of them will grow past that mark next year in one year. But then after that, about one out of every four, so 25%, will go from 100,000 followers to over 300,000 followers. And then after that, one out of every three will go above a million. So like, uh, so if you work with 200 influencers, uh, I'm trying to do the math right now, so 6%, so 100 influencers, six of them will get to having over 100,000. After that, two of them will get to having, or I guess one and a half, but anyways, you get the idea, right? It's about a 200 to one ratio, where if you work with 200 micro-influencers, at least one of them will end up having over a million followers within the next few years. And so it ends up being this kind of investment in the future that should pay dividends not only today, but in the long run as well. Um, what you're saying is so true because it's basically why we invest in uh, such a long-term relationship and that's why uh, we have a big team for influencer marketing is because we know that if you only have one or two person, you cannot maintain this relationship over time. I mean, you're going to the influencer is going to lose interest about your friends because you don't treat them as your best friend. But just one of the few examples that we do that I think are quite unique uh, for this kind of um, long-term relationship we're building is that whenever one of our influencers has uh, a birthday, it's Mother's Day, and they need some jewelry to give and it's COVID, they cannot get into a store. If they just text us or email us or call us, we'll send jewelry and we don't ask for content or we don't ask for anything. Um, if we feel like, you know, they're pregnant, they're going to give birth, well, we'll send flowers. Uh, we do Christmas gifts. And, and, and I mean, we're really trying to become their friends and like in the most genuine and authentic way. And, and that's, I think, one of the, the key metrics that you have on your dashboard is how often influencers are talking about you, right? And I think that, so we get it to one time per month and many companies are doing better, but I believe we get to there, we get there because really like uh, they do it in the most, like it's pure love. Like I would say at, at the end, it's pure love of them like saying like, well, today I'm going to wear my enemies at jewelry. I don't have any contract. I don't have anything with them, but I, if I take a selfie, then I'll make sure that I tag them. Mm -hmm. Same goes for the co-creations. I would say you have some, specific amount of content that you want them to, to release. Uh, but once everything is done, they are still wearing the jewelry every single day on every single platform they use. Uh, and this means like so many occurrences of your products happening again and again, just because the person really likes the product they were able to make. Um, and that goes in the same, yeah, in the same way. Yeah, I think, I mean, on the, this idea of long-term relationship building, you know, Adam, one of the things we talked about was Fashion Nova, who is like the number one brand that we track. And what's surprising is if you were to look at the coverage that they got in 2019, you know, 90% of it came from the exact same people as 2018. So only 10% was new people. 90% was the same. But what happened is those people provided double the coverage in 2019 that they did in 2018. So without finding anybody new, they doubled the coverage because those people grew and they posted more often. 
Um, and so although they did add some new people, like that wasn't the story, right? Like that wasn't what drove it for them. Um, so it's, I mean, there's a reason you guys are growing so quickly. And it's, I tell you what, you guys look at the playbook you've laid out and this would be the playbook I would design. Uh, so you guys are just on the point uh, and I am not surprised uh, to see where you're at. Um, Okay, so I think we're gonna do uh, two things last, right? So I'm gonna ask you one more question, and then we'll do a couple of just fun end of show questions that you guys don't know about. Um, and so the last question, so for people that want to be in your shoes, right? So for somebody that wants to start their own brand and really wants to learn about influencers, what are the resources you guys read every day? It's so like, what newsletters do you subscribe to that you think are great? What articles do you read? What blogs? Would love to hear that just for the people that want to uh, kind of read the same things that you're reading. Um, so marketing wise, uh, I'll even say that uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, um, it's kind of, uh, I would say my number one uh, source of learning right now uh, um, because I mean, the format is so, so convenient and you can, uh, you know, in the subway anywhere. Um, the second thing that I would really, really recommend anyone to do is uh, do your search in the sense that you see this company that is growing so fast, how do they do it? And like try to break down all their strategies. And, and today you have so many free available tools. Uh, I'm just thinking like, you want to see how much traffic they're doing every month, just use similar web. You want to see like what kind of backlinks they have, just use Ahrefs. Uh, um, when you see their ads, you can use Facebook. Facebook ad library is becoming transparent. Uh, I mean, we are using Tribe Dynamics to check like what kind of influencers are working with other brands, right? You know, uh, that's why I was so excited about the, the launch feature of that uh, that is getting released uh, today. And, and like, just dig everything, try to put it on paper. So, all right, so that's the number of influencers they do. That's the traffic. Most of them seems to be correlated to this kind of influencers that are posting on this platform. And like, do your homework, uh, do your research, uh, um, and you're going to find out something that is working. Um, it's the best advice that I can give is like, try to do things on your own and obviously talk with the, the, the player in the space. Like, we would have never figured anything about co-creation without sitting down and taking coffees with a with influencers, like right. having them in the office and spending hours taking notes. They were kind of, you know, showing us and they're very proud of it. And it's amazing. They were showing us their Instagram, their analytics, everything. And they, were, <laughs> and, and they understand it so much better than any gross marketer in any company. Like, yeah. no wonder that these ninjas and all these influencers are superstars of marketing. They really understand it inside out. So like really sit with them and talk to them and you're going to take the best masterclass of marketing you can get. For sure. I I ended up on one of those, because during COVID, right, I'm trying to, like, I don't have anybody to bullshit with anymore. I can't, like, talk to my coworkers. So I, like, have to keep myself entertained while I'm, like, working on my computer. So somehow I ended up on a YouTube channel for Mr. Beast, B-E-A-S-T, who is the fastest growing YouTuber of all time. And he's, like, this 21-year-old kid from North Carolina but he just does like really good stuff. And like, it's just really good content. It's like, shit, I'm like learning some stuff here from this 21 year old kid. Um, so yeah. Okay, so last two kind of end of the show questions. So, um, so first, um, who, so you guys have to answer at the same time, who has the better taste in uh, clothes and fashion? David. Adam or David? <laughs> <laughs> It's different. You have a white t-shirt and a black t-shirt. So it's not. Oh, right. <laughs> I guess you have the right shirt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I wore this as a joke the first podcast we recorded because, like, I decided we were going to do this podcast in like three days in February. I'm like, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. I invited people in, got a studio space in LA, did it, and uh, I was like, I'm just going to wear a Hawaiian shirt. Like, <laughs> fuck it, whatever, right? And then, uh, and then the next one, I didn't wear one, and our uh, one of the Taylor, who's helping me out, was like, why aren't you wearing a Hawaiian shirt? Like, that's your thing now. And so now I think what I have to do is I think I have a budget. I'm going to I'm gonna create a budget for myself just for Hawaiian shirts because I'm running out of them to just new one every every show so I can have like a hundred by the end. Uh, 
<laughs> just as like a memento, you know? Maybe I'll make it into like a quilt later, like a little patch out of each one when I'm old. Um, anyways, okay, so last question. Um, Paris or New York? New York, New York yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll make sure this one doesn't get distributed in France. Uh, <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out today. I wish you continued success. Um, you, you guys are really nailing everything we would suggest in terms of approach. Um, so, you know, this is should really, hopefully people learned a lot today because this is how, this is the playbook I would run if I was running a brand. So, um, so congrats again. And thanks for taking the time out. And um, yeah, good luck uh, with the with the continued growth. Thank, Thank you so much. It was fantastic. It was very fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye, Bye everyone. Right. Thanks for tuning in. Hit subscribe now. Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Tribe Dynamics unlocks your social media influencer community. Our platform not only tracks and measures your best influencer relationships, but discovers new influencers to grow your business through earned media. Get started with a demo today at tribedynamics.com. Tribedynamics.com.